Welcome to our second lecture covering sexual harassment. In our first lecture, we covered our first two topics, kind of an introduction to sexual harassment. We discussed uh, kind of the culture and where we are on that topic. And then we talked about the, really the heart of the lecture, which is uh, the two categories of sexual harassment that the law recognizes, and that is quid pro quo, this for that type of harassment, and the hostile work environment harassment. So now we're ready for our third topic. So I'm going to advance to slide 42. And here we are, we're gonna cover employment liability and then we're gonna talk about tort and criminal claims that can arise in the context of sexual harassment. So at this point, we've discussed things that qualify as sexual harassment and I've kind of skirted around the topic of why do employers care about this? After all, it's coworkers in many cases telling dirty jokes or touching inappropriately. Uh, not wholesome things. Certainly employers don't want that happening because it's a distraction from whatever the uh, job responsibilities of the individuals might be. But why do employers care beyond that? And the reality is that sexual harassment is a claim that the victim can allege against obviously the perpetrators, the people who harassed him or her, but also the employer. And so that's when we're really focused, I guess, as an employer. So the employer really has kind of three concerns. One, one is you could say kind of a justice concern. They want to be a good employer. They want to keep a, a safe and pleasant work environment for their employees simply because they want to be good corporate citizens. Um, and maybe also related to that is they don't want to be on the front page of the Dallas Morning News with some scandal associated with them. A second thing is that workers who are being harassed and workers who are har harassing are obviously not doing their job. And that means that the employer is paying for time and effort that is not being directed at accomplishing the employer's task. So we have loss in efficiency both because this takes up a lot of time and also because people who are subject to harassment, the morale drops, their focus drops, they are less productive at work. And so there's an actual productivity cost that the employer has. But the one that we focus on, honestly, in this course is the third concern, the legal liability issue. It's not the only concern, and it may not even be the most pressing concern, but that's the focus of this class, and so that's what we're going to focus on. We talked in the first lecture about how employers usually set their bar of what the behavior is that they will per permit significantly below where the legal line is. And in part, that's because of those first two reasons. They want to be a good corporate citizen, and they want the workplace to be productive. And and honestly, the workplace has ceased to be productive well before you get to the threshold that the law requires in order to have a sexual, successful sexual harassment claim. But of course, the third reason that employers want a low bar in compared to the law is that they want to give themselves some uh, some uh, uh, flexibility, some some um, breathing space, some margin, so that they can, um, you know, if they don't catch it quick enough they can address it before they even approach the unlawful line. So that's, in, in very briefly, what the focus is going to be at this next section. So let's talk about the two categories of situations as we talked about before. One is when tangible employment action has happened. This is that quid pro quo situation. And in these situations, there's nothing that the employer can do. If the facts bear out that this person was harassed and he or she lost his or her position as a result of the harassment or was denied a promotion or was demoted or whatever the negative implication is, as long as there was a negative tangible job action, there's no way that the employer can escape liability. It's just a done deal. The employer can argue the facts and say, well, maybe there wasn't a tangible action or maybe this wasn't harassment. But if those facts are, are what the jury ultimately concludes, the employer is going to be liable. There's going to be a paper trail typically in these cases though, and this is an opportunity for the employer to kind of bring its A game to this equation. If, uh, let's say, Sally is being harassed at work and is refusing to submit to whatever the overtures are and the boss fires Sally, well, there's gonna be a paper trail. There's going to be a, 
uh, well, we're firing Sally. And so that's when the HR manager is in a position to make sure that everything checks out, that in fact, the real reason why the manager wants to fire Sally is job performance and not some other reason. Uh, during the exit interview, there's that opportunity for Sally to say, wait a second, I think this is happening because I'm being sexually harassed. And so it gives an opportunity for the company to pause and say, is this what we want to have happen? Because we can still stop it. Because there isn't, um, uh, you know, we're in the process of, of implementing this tangible job action. So that's something to watch out for. When you do termination interviews, when you do, uh, when you approve um, a line manager promoting one person over another, be on the lookout for concerns like this. Be open to the possibility that there may be more going on if you're in the position where you are approving or entering the data or whatever the circumstances might be. So you do still have some control to avoid liability. But I'll be honest, most sexual harassment cases don't fall into the first category. We're in the second category. And that's good news for the employers because, uh, first of all, the fact that there's been no tangible job action means that damages are probably pretty small. Um, and that has two really good implications for the employer. First of all, if the employer is sued and loses, there's going to be less money that has to be paid. So that's good news for the employer. The second piece of good news is probably the bigger deal, which is it's going to be more difficult for that employee to persuade an attorney to take his or her case if there aren't significant damages, because after all, the attorney is typically going to be accepting a uh, percentage of whatever the plaintiff recovers. And so if the amount that the plaintiff is able to recover relatively modest, it's going to be more difficult to persuade an attorney to take the case. So um, that is a factor in the equation. Now, of course, as I said before, we're concerned about liability, but we're also concerned about having a pleasant working environment where people can be productive and safe. And so while we want to focus on the liability, we also want to be aware that there's more going on here. Even if we're 100% persuaded this person is never going to sue us or this person is never going to get an attorney, that doesn't, of course, mean well, we can let them be sexually harassed. Obviously, that would be uh, foolish on all kinds of levels, but uh, it, it is useful to be aware of, of the dynamic of how likely the, the lawsuit is going to be. So we're in the second area where there is no tangible employment action taken. So this means that the employer is not going to be strictly liable. The employer has a way out of liability even if the jury believes that sexual harassment has happened. And uh, the path for that is the Farragher-Ellerth uh, uh, defense. And I have these, the names in the opposite direction. Um, usually people say Farragher-Ellerth instead of ellerth Farragher. Uh, I think it's a little easier to pronounce, uh, but either order is fine. These are two U.S. Supreme Court cases. Uh, you have to kind of take them both together because they each tell about half of the story. That's why we think of them in combination. The decisions issued on the same date from the U.S. Supreme Court. So definitely the court intended for these two cases to be uh, viewed as one unit. So um, the, the issue is going to be whether there's going to be liability or not is going to be whether the employer had an effective prevention policy in place and whether the plaintiff unreasonably failed to use it. So you can see there's going to be two parts that the um, uh, a jury is going to be considering after it's determined that sexual harassment ha has happened. First is, did the employer have an effective prevention policy in place and we'll talk about exactly what's required. This is the reason why we have sexual harassment training in the workplace. Um, this is why uh, we have sexual harassment hotlines. It would be great if we lived in a world where the corporations were concerned about employees and they didn't wait for a legal reason to be worried about that, but perhaps that's being a little bit Pollyanna to assume that we would be living in that world. But whatever world we're living in, we're living in a world with lots of sexual harassment training. Very likely if you are uh, practicing in the area of employment law or you're an HR manager, you will be responsible for conducting 
sexual harassment training. You may be responsible for documenting attendance or uh, things along those lines with sexual harassment training. There's lots of different ways of engaging in sexual harassment training. You can have um, a computer-based training where you watch scenarios and you read screens and you take tests. Or you can have uh, meetings where somebody is presenting in the front of the room. Or you can even have videotapes that employees watch. How you go about presenting sexual harassment training is going to depend upon the culture of your organization and the level of risk that is associated with it, plus also the size of your workforce and the turnover rate. If you are, say, in retail and you happen to hire a lot of people, say, during the months of November and December, but they're just going to be with you for a matter of a few weeks, it doesn't make sense to spend a tremendous amount of money on sexual harassment training. So a video for those folks may be completely appropriate. But the individuals who are going to remain with you, you know, year in and year out, you, those individuals probably need a, a more robust training program than watching a 15 or 30 minute video. And so you may want to have differing approaches. One approach, for example, for part-time or uh, temporary hires, one approach for non-supervisory folks who are permanent, and then a third approach for your supervisory folks. Um, and of course, whatever method or, or approach you use, uh, you want to have a system of making sure that you're recording the date and the time and the contents of whatever that training is. If you don't record it, for the most part, it's like it never really happened because you may say, well, we have it. We offer this training to everybody, but the particular person who is suing may well say, well, I never saw that video. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe they're telling the truth. Maybe they're not, but the jury is going to believe them if there isn't a, a very strong paper trail or electronic uh, trail to show this person was actually trained. Uh, let's look here. Uh, the EOC and courts take the position that the best thing an employer can do to effectively keep sexual harassment complaints at a minimum is to prevent the, the behavior from occurring. And so a sexual harassment training is the path for that. Let's consider a scenario. So Bob is a maintenance worker at a particular business. He is sexually attracted to Mary, one of the instructors. So there is no reporting relationship. Mary doesn't report to Bob. Bob doesn't report to Mary. Though Mary has shown no interest in him, she, he is stalking Mary, making lewd comments, making sexual threats. Uh, Bob has been very careful, though, to keep his behavior very low profile. He just does this when it's he and Mary alone. And uh, Mary chooses not to bring up this matter with anyone in management. She decides to quit her job, though, and she files a charge of sexual harassment against the company. Well, the company can avoid liability if it can show that it had no way to know that this uh, sexual harassment conduct was ongoing. This is one of the reasons you want to have an exit interview with people leaving. Now, every organization does this differently. And again, an organization has a very high turnover where people are temporary. It may not make sense to have an involved uh, exit interview. You may just want to give them a form that they can fill out. But whatever the mechanism is, you want to have a place on that form or that meeting where the person can say, you know, anything you want us to know, you know, is there anything you want us to know? And Mary could write out at that point, well, Bob did X, Y, Z to me. So that gives the employer an opportunity to fix it at that point. Oh, Mary, we didn't know this was a concern you have. We'd like to investigate it. We'd like a statement from you. We want to figure out what's happening. Would you be willing to uh, delay your exit from the organization? And so we could explore that in more detail. That's a way to reduce the risk. In this case, Mary apparently did not choose to take advantage of that. So under the Farragher-Ellerth defense, the, the employer doesn't know about it. Maybe the employer did have an effective prevention policy in place, but Mary unreasonably failed to use it. So that would, be, that would give the employer an opening to allege that um, it can assert this defense. Now, can Bob escape liability? No, unfortunately not for Bob. He's still going to be liable, but we're not focused so much on Bob. We're not Bob's uh, HR manager, or we may be Bob's HR manager. We're not, uh, we don't work for Bob, and, and Bob isn't our client. And so, and, and honestly, Bob doesn't have a deep pocket. He's a maintenance worker. So even if Mary chooses to sue him, 
uh, she's probably not seeing likely to receive a very large recovery, but that's between her and Bob. That's really not our concern. Our concern as the HR manager or the legal professional who's supporting uh, the, the employer, we're concerned about that, that employer's level of exposure. Let's consider the next scenario. Mary is an electronics assembler at Fox Industries factory. She's sexually propositioned by Bob, who's the head of the quality control department. After Mary's refusal, Bob starts finding fault with the quality of her work and she's eventually demoted. Now let's notice something here. Bob has a higher position than Mary, but it doesn't seem probably that Mary reports directly to Bob, but Bob's uh, function can impact Mary. And so this is a situation where there isn't a direct reporting relationship, but there's still interaction between the two functions. Mary believes that she complains against Bob to the company's management, no action will be taken because of his reputation with senior management. Though Fox Industries has a sexual harassment policy in place, Mary does not use it. Instead, she files a complaint with the EOC. Fox Industries will be liable to Mary for quid pro quo harassments um, for the action of its supervisor, Bob. The challenge here is that Mary actually did receive a, a tangible job action. So going back to our schema here, when we have a tangible job action, the employer is strictly liable. So it doesn't really matter how robust and awesome Fox Industries uh, sexual harassment prevention program is, when there's a tangible job action, uh, to Fox Industries is going to be uh, strictly liable uh, based upon uh, Bob's conduct, vicariously liable under you know, respondeat superior, um, that idea. So you may say, well, in this situation, really Fox Industries didn't get any bang out of its sexual harassment buck. That's not really true. For one thing, having this policy in effect um, is going to stop some people from doing what Bob did. I mean, obviously he didn't stop Bob from doing what Bob did, but there are employees, once they receive the training and understand, oops, if I do that, I'm going to get fired, who may be much more reluctant to engage in the behavior. But I mean, we can't really test that. We don't know how many people would have harassed if they hadn't been trained and didn't know about the robustness of the program, but it's safe to assume that there's probably some. So that's one reason the program works. Another reason the program works is that Mary might have used it. Obviously, in this case, Mary didn't use it, but many employees will choose to use it. And um, if she had complained early on, before there was the demotion, then it could well be that you, we could have avoided the demotion. And so, yes, it didn't work in this case, but that doesn't mean it won't work in every case. But there's a third reason why we want, that we're still getting some bang from our sexual harassment policy bucks, so to speak, and that is the jury's going to hear about it. Um, and so even though, yes, we're going to have liability, when the jury considers things like punitive damages, they will know that Fox Industries was being, trying to be a good corporate citizen. Wasn't perfect, but, um, you know, it, it, it probably doesn't deserve a heavy hit on the punitive damages side. And so uh, damages may be less, even though the liability is going to be strict. Sometimes what happens is that it's not a manager or supervisor or higher up in the organization who is the harasser. We can have coworkers. In fact, I would say coworker harassment is probably as common or more common than uh, supervisor harassment. You can also, though, have third party harassment. It might be a customer, let's say. And in fact, uh, in my experience at, at JCPenney, uh, we would have situations where a customer would uh, become interested in a particular uh, sales associate or sales employee and that customer would keep on coming in and wanting to talk with the employee. Maybe they're buying something, maybe they're not. Um, obviously it's a public place so they kind of can just come in whenever they want and that can certainly become a harassing environment for that a sales employee. And so uh, the issue is, is what kind of liability does the company have in those situations? So customers are a common scenario. Another common scenario can be other people, uh, maybe who work for other businesses uh, that 
that your business has a connection with maybe the other business is a vendor or maybe you're a vendor to that other business um, there can be all kinds of business relationships so that people are working together even though they um, aren't actually employed by the same company maybe there's a staffing uh, agency involved in, in either the harass uh, the, the victim or the harassers circumstances so how do we contend with these situations? What level of liability does the employer have? Um, and so here's the answer. Um, the um, employer is liable if the acts of harassment were known, yet no corrective, corrective action was taken. So, this, so obviously we can't really have a, a, an adverse job action under these circumstances because it's not the employer who's harassing. Now I suppose you could have a situation where a customer is rebuffed by an employee and the customer you know, makes up a fake uh, customer complaint and the employee is demoted or fired for that reason. So I suppose you could have it and in that situation there wouldn't be a strict liability situation. But most cases, we're just in the hostile work environment scenario, wherein the uh, a customer is just a, being a pest and maybe even being a scary pest. So I don't mean to trivialize it by using the word pest. So the employee, the person who's being harassed, needs to let the employer know the employer can't solve a problem about which it's unaware. But I want to flag this one because sometimes the way it's communicated is a little different than maybe the official channels because many times the employee doesn't think of this as sexual harassment because it's not a boss doing it. It may not even be a coworker doing it. It's this person off the street. And so they may say something to their supervisor or manager, but they may not use words like sexual harassment. And so they're lodging a complaint, but it may not seem like the category that we're supposed to investigate. So it might be something like, we'll say Larry's the, the, the customer. Larry makes me feel uncomfortable. Hey boss, could, could you maybe have somebody else next time Larry comes in, somebody else help Larry because he's creeping me out. That type of thing is possibly a complaint of sexual harassment. And so the uh, employee, the, the management or supervisory employees have to be trained to be aware of those issues, especially for employees who deal with the public as part of their, their job responsibilities. And so keep in mind that anytime there's a complaint along those lines, it needs to be addressed. You might say, well, what are we supposed to do? I mean, we can't very well fire Larry, our customer. Well, that's true. Certainly in extreme cases, though, Larry can be barred from the store. He can be trespassed for the, from the store, for example. Um, certainly um, other people can assist Larry when uh, Larry comes into the store. So you could have a system in which a supervisor is that, that the, let's say, Mary is the one who is being targeted by Larry. Um, when Larry approaches Mary, Mary could say, uh, let me call for, us for assistance for you and someone else can be called to help Larry. Um, those are some approaches that can uh, diffuse the situation and hopefully cause Larry to move on and not uh, continue to be an issue. Those are appropriate fixes. Obviously, we're not probably going to be able to fix Larry. I mean, we, we can talk to him and say, hey, you know what? Mary doesn't want your attention. Um, please go to another sales associate. But at the end of the day, you know, he doesn't work for us, so we have limited abilities. So we have to manage it, kind of working into the assumption that Larry isn't going to change. Let's consider the scenario. So Mary's an employee at Koala Bear Cola Warehouse. Uh, Bob is a truck driver working with the logistics company that supplies Koala Bear Cola to all supermarkets. He makes lewd comments and asks for sexual favors whenever he sees Mary. Mary complains to him about this, but he continues to do it. Mary goes to the supervisor. Supervisor says, oh, not our problem, because Bob works for somebody else, works for a different company. So the problem isn't solved. Under this scenario, a koala bear is going to be liable for sexual harassment uh, because um, of the uh, hostile work environment that Bob has created. So what should the supervisor have done? Well, first of all, uh, Thank Mary for raising the concern. Get us, a, a, and then director to HR. If HR is the entity in this organization that conducts the sexual harassment investigation, um, let's assume it's somebody in HR. HR is going to talk with Mary. Hopefully, get a statement from her. Try to get corroborating information. Is there a camera that might have caught some of these interactions? Um, are there coworkers who may have seen or heard something? Um, and then. Um, 
the HR manager will likely contact uh, Bob's employer and say that that um, there's this complaint being lodged against Bob and that uh, they would like to get Bob's statement. Sometimes the employer may allow the HR person at Mary's employer to um, interview Bob. Sometimes they may insist on interviewing Bob themselves and providing a statement or summary to you. Um, but in any event, you need to get to hear Bob's side of the story, obviously. And then, of course, you make a credibility determination. Now, you can't discipline Bob. You can't give him a corrective interview or fire him from his employer because he doesn't work for you. But you can ban him from your facility. You can say, Bob isn't welcome. You, know, you need to get another driver to come in here if you decide that, that's, uh, that Bob is not a good fit. Uh, there may be some other approaches that are less onerous. For example, um, maybe Bob is always in the shipping uh, shipping section A, and Mary and, and Mary's also in shipping section A. But there's also a shipping section B. Well, perhaps Bob could be moved there. Now, of course, if Bob's moved there and now he's harassing someone else, that's not a very good solution. So you have to make sure that you monitor situations ongoing. Now, if Bob is removed from the account, there isn't really so much of a need to monitor, but there is a need if he is continuing to service this account. So the HR professional ought to routinely go and speak to the people in the work area, and not just Mary, and not just women to make sure that the whole environment is appropriate, that people are doing the work they need to do, and that there are no unnecessary distractions. So here's a little bit more about the Farragher and Ellis uh, cases. We'll, we'll see more in a few minutes about it as well. The U.S. Supreme Court in its Farragher and Ellis decisions held that employers are vicariously liable for unlawful sexual harassment by employees, uh, unlawful sexual harassment of employees by company supervisors. The reason for this is that the uh, court wanted employers to really care about sexual harassment. And if employers know they're going to be on the hook if their managers are engaging in sexual harassment, that adds additional motivation for the employer to train uh, individuals about what the expectations are. And it also motivates employers to take pretty significant disciplinary action if somebody does engage in appropriate behavior. That's one of the most powerful ways to communicate within the organization that, you know what, better not do that because I know Susan got fired for doing that or Teresa got fired for doing that or Larry got fired for doing that. Um, whenever we look at harassment, be it sexual harassment or racial harassment or whatever, the harassment for it to be um, legally uh, per, uh, impermissible, it has to involve a protected characteristic of that person. So, for example, let's say I'm harassed at work for being left-handed. Well, I mean, obviously that's not a productive thing to have happen in the workplace. The employer isn't going to want that to happen simply because that means people aren't doing their work. But um, it, it, it's not a legal claim. I mean, left-handedness is not a protected category. Or let's say I'm being harassed because I have red hair or because I have freckles or because I'm short, or because I'm tall. Uh, in extreme cases, shortness and tallness can be disabilities, but for the most part, it's not going to be a disability. I'm not saying that you ought to permit harassment in those areas, but it doesn't raise a legal claim. Another example would be, uh, maybe I'm being harassed because I just had my 30th birthday. Everybody's telling jokes about me being over the hill. They're uh, make, acting like I'm really super old. Well, in fact, age discrimination is a protected category, but it only applies to people over the age of 40. So under these scenarios, I would not have a successful harassment claim. Sometimes people get confused about that, and you'll see employees who come to you saying, I want to complain about harassment. But what they say they're being harassed about isn't about some protected characteristics such as race or sex or religion or something like that. Now, certainly employers are wise to take those complaints and to investigate them because, again, they're indications that the, uh, the, the people in the workplace are not being productive. But they don't raise legal issues usually. An employer is strictly liable for quid pro quo harassment or quid pro quo discrimination by a supervisor. There is no defense to the claim if it is proved. So let's consider our next scenario. Mary is the only employee and the only female managing, uh, man, excuse me, marketing manager at Dragon Distillery. 
She's constantly referred to as Sexy Mary by her uh, male colleagues. They leave nude pictures on her desk. They send her vulgar emails. They follow her to the restroom. Pretty creepy stuff here. Bob, a colleague of Mary, tries to get physically intimate with her one day at work. Mary complains to HR, which is smart. She's told the guys are just having a little fun and she should be a good sport if she wants to progress in the field. Obviously, under these situations, because the, the HR department did not investigate her complaints, she complained about it and they didn't solve the problem, a dragon distillery is going to be liable for sexual harassment, even though it doesn't, it looks like it's just a hostile work environment situation. So how could dragon distillery have avoided this? Well, again, thanking Mary when she brings forward the concern, getting her side of the story, interviewing other people, looking for corroborating data, and then uh, taking appropriate disciplinary action if it ends up that the behavior is actually occurring. That would have been a way for Dragon Distillery to probably avoid all liability or at least to significantly reduce the risk of liability. Let's consider this scenario. So Bob is the branch manager at a bank. He hires Mary as a teller, so Bob is her su superior. A few months later, she, he urges her to engage in some sexual activity in exchange for promotion to the position of senior teller. Feel, fearful of losing her job, Mary agrees. After a year of sexual, a sexual relationship with him, she tells him it's over. Then she applies for the job of assistant branch manager, but Bob selects another employee who isn't as qualified as Mary. In spite of the bank's well-developed sexual harassment policy, which requires complaints of sexual harassment be made to the HR Human Resources Department, Mary files a claim with the EOC. So Mary did not complain within the organization, and certainly the HR department isn't the people who was harassing Mary, so it would have been reasonable for Mary to go there. But the farragher ellerth defense doesn't apply to these circumstances because Mary was... Um, not promoted. She applies for the job, but she isn't promoted. So she does have a tangible job action. And so there's going to be strict liability under quid pro quo harassment for the bank. And obviously also for Bob. So now we're really up to the Farragher Ellerth case. As you've probably gathered, this is a really important one. Um, so you need to know the name of it. You don't need to know the Boca Raton part, but you do need to know this name. You also need to know the Ellerth name. You can say them in whichever order you want. Um, so what is the issue? May an employer be held liable for the actions of an employee whose sexual harassment of subordinates has created um, a hostile work environment? And the answer is yes. So in this situation, oh, sorry, here, let's just look at the facts of the scenario. Oh, I guess I don't have, oh, facts. After resigning as a lifeguard, Farragher filed a lawsuit alleging that her supervisors created a sexually hostile environment by their touching, remarking, and commenting. So in this situation, this is a hostile work environment, but the person who's making it hostile is her supervisor. So we talked before when it was coworker, hostile work environment that the employer could advance the uh, the defense, the affirmative action defense. We talked about when it was quid pro quo that it was a strict liability situation. But here we have almost kind of a, a combination of those two. We have the hostile work environment, but we also have the supervisor engaging in it. And so the court said when a supervisor is engaging in hostile work environment behavior, there is also strict liability. So the supervisor who engages in hostile work environment or engages in quid pro quo activity is going to make himself or herself liable, obviously, but also the employer. The hostile work environment by coworkers by outside vendors, by customers. That's the situation where the farragher Ellerth Affirmative Defense works. So keep those three categories in mind and know where the liability is going to be. So an employer is vicariously liable under Title VII for actionable discrimination caused by a supervisor. In this case, the actual discrimination is sexual harassment. The court has held that such liability is subject to an affirmative defense looking to the reasonableness of the employer's conduct as well as that of the plaintiff victim. In case, so now we're going to the Ellerth part. In cases where the harassed employee has suffered no job-related consequences, employers may defend themselves against liability by showing they quickly acted to prevent and correct any harassing behavior and that the harassed employee failed to utilize their employer's protection. 
but such a defense is not actionable when the alleged harassment culminates in an adverse employment action, such as the Ellerth case. So we need to know about Farragher and Ellerth to know the full story. I don't have a separate uh, job summary, or not job summary, a case summary for um, the Ellerth case. This is just my little blurb here because the two are just very, very closely aligned with each other. And so it's kind of useful to think of them as one unit. Let's consider employer policies. So now we're looking at what are the nuts and bolts of this? How does an employer avoid the strict liability scenario? And this is a, an important way for the employer to manage the risk of employment litigation. So both on the HR side and on the legal department side, the employer needs to think carefully about how to design the sexual harassment prevention program and how to um, set up reporting structures so that uh, the complaints can be uh, 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 developed and investigated and the employer needs to also decide how the investigations are going to happen because time really is of the essence. It's kind of a drop everything and just work on this type of scenario. You can't wait 24 hours to start addressing a sexual harassment complaint. Um, so let's consider here. So we want to train all employees regarding sexual harassment policy. It's a good idea to train new hires as part of that onboarding process, ideally on their first day of employment, but if it takes a few days, that's okay, but you wouldn't want it to be more than a week. Now you might want to have, again, a, that two-step process, something that you do during the onboarding process, maybe a 15 or 30 minute video that they watch that you document, and then you might have a more robust training when, you know, you kind of have the time to spend a little bit more focus on it. And one reason not to roll out the, the really uh, involved program during that onboarding process is that the employee is uh, learning so many new things and is kind of being overwhelmed. And so, uh, to throw out a lot of the specifics and expect them to retain that information is probably not that realistic. What you don't want is you don't want a sexual harassment prevention policy that is all about avoiding liability. Yes, it's true that if you have a robust program that you roll out on that first day of onboarding, uh, yeah, I mean, you're going to be able to assert the farragher Ellerth defense in a hostile work environment situation. But is that the most effective time to really do the deep dive? I would suggest that what you really want to do is reduce the likelihood of sexual harassment. You want your program to be effective, not just from a litigation avoidance perspective. So you want to have it be at a time where, you know, the employee has been acclimated. He or she knows who people are. And, you know, when, when somebody says, I'm the person you make sexual harassment complaints to, they know who that person is. They know where that person's office is. They have some level of rapport with that person. And so um, having a two-tier approach can be a good idea. Another problem that sometimes employers do is they don't do retraining. It's a good idea to have at least some level of retraining every year. So you might have some short onboard training on that first or second day. Then you might have a more robust program some point during the year. And then you might have a refresher course every year. Again, it might be a 15 or 30 minute video. It can even be the same video. You don't have to necessarily go out and, and have lots of different videos. Um, and you can buy these commercially. Um, there are lots of generic ones out there um, that you can you know, stick in the DVD player and, and watch uh, from that perspective. So there's lots of options that don't have to be really, really expensive, um, but they can be effective uh, at addressing the harassment. So, or avoiding the harassment problem. It needs to again be uh, at the beginning of the employment and periodically repeated. Again, probably on an annual basis makes sense. The attendance ought to be documented and you ought to document it in a way that it's just not going to be disputed that the person actually did it. So um, you want to probably have that person sign in. It can be an electronic signature. It can be a, um, a wet signature. But if it's a wet signature, you want to enter it somehow electronically as well and keep that backup documentation. And ideally, you, you probably want to have uh, them enter that they're participating at the beginning of the program. Maybe, hey, everybody, let's go ahead and log on to our computers and, and uh, make sure that they've actually entered it. So you don't want to trust that they're going to enter at some later point their attendance. They may forget or they may be intentionally 
trying to say, oh, I never attended. Um, and so you want to make sure that it is documented. And it ought to be somebody's job in the HR department to go through the list. So, you know, maybe this uh, firm has 300 employees. Go through the list. Did everybody, uh, is there documentation for all 300 employees that they attended? Oh, wait, we're missing Bob's documentation. We'll need to provide training for him now. Even if he says, oh, I attended it, well, uh, that Bob, you probably did, but we need to have you be retrained and have you contemporaneously document that you attend. Another thing that the, our textbook author sentence, or does suggest is having in-house alternative dispute resolution resources. Um, I don't recommend this. I don't think this is a good idea. It's I don't know if it's all the way to a bad idea, but this suggests that you're having you know dozens of these. Uh, issues come up. Um, sexual harassment complaints shouldn't be frequent. If you're having a situation, I mean, if you're a large employer and you're having a situation where you're routinely getting these complaints, there's something toxic in your culture and you need to address that as opposed to just saying, oh, well, this is what our culture is. So we're going to have to do alternative dispute resolution to um, manage the risk associated with all these sexual harassment issues. Um, instead, get at the, the problem say this is not okay start firing people basically and get rid of the bad apples or and scare the people who would be bad apples um, into not being bad apples and then address the program going forward now of course once a, a matter does uh, become a, a matter of litigation ADR can be a good uh, way to to redress those those issues um, I'm not discouraging ADR ADR is a great uh, approach in litigation. Um, it is certainly less acrimonious, it's less expensive, it's less time consuming than litigation. It's also private. So once litigation seems clear, absolutely use ADR. But the idea that you're going to have just lots and lots of these cases and you're going to use ADR routinely, um, I am not on board with. <laughs> so you need to have at least two prongs to your reporting mechanism. And the reason you need to have two is that uh, what if the if you only have one place that the person can go to, what if that person ends up being the harasser? So let's say the instructions are go to the head of HR. Well, head of HR is the one harassing me. Well, that's not going to work. Um, you also want to have at least two because maybe the head of HR is on vacation. Um, and so the person is unavailable. Maybe they're on a two-week vacation or maybe they had surgery and they're out for six weeks. Um, you want to have um, at least two prongs, at least two people within the organization uh, that the issue can be reported to. In a large organization and even sometimes in a small organization, it's a good idea to have a 1-800 hotline. Uh, these can be manned by people specific to your organization or more likely you would hire an outside business that would answer the phones for you. You know, something like, let's say your company is Dragon Distillery. So they would answer the phone, Dragon Distillery, employee hotline, how may I help you? And of course the, the caller is reading a script at this point on, the, on his or her monitor saying these words, the next call he might get might be from a completely different business. That can be a good way of, um, having an external uh, very reliable mechanism for making the complaint um, so that can be a third prong maybe someone in HR maybe your manager uh, maybe your manager's manager and maybe this 1-800 number so those are some things to think about um, in addressing this there's usually not a downside to having more uh, prongs than necessary. The only thing is that you, anyone who is a prong or a potential prong needs to be trained about how to handle sexual harassment complaints. And there can be a variety of levels of training. Just because a person is the person who the complaint may be uh, made to doesn't mean that's the person who's going to investigate the complaint. So let's say the instructions for your sexual harassment program says you can report it to your supervisor. Well, the supervisor needs to know how to uh, accept the complaint, you know, you might have a procedure like this, thank the person, you know, uh, take the person to a, a private area, probably leave the door open so there can't be any uh, concerns along those lines, but um, uh, thank the person for raising the issue, um, make sure that you understand what 
in very general terms what the complaint is. In other words, it's a sexual harassment complaint or it's a religious discrimination complaint or whatever, but you can get at least enough information so you know the category of complaints that it is. And then walk that person to HR and say, this is the person who will be able to help you. Now, what you might want to do is, is step out for a moment as the manager and talk on your cell phone to, hey, Bob in HR, what am I supposed to do? Who should I, I've got somebody who's complaining about sexual harassment. Who do, who do I need to take this person to see? So, you know, you certainly can stop out and have that conversation so you know where to take the person. Usually you want to take that person right then and there to the resource. Um, even if the person is reluctant, oh, I don't want to talk to them. Oh, unless that, again, again you, if they say, I don't want to talk to them, you want to say, well, is this person somehow involved in the harassment? Well, no, no, they're not involved. Okay, well, this is the person that the company has who's been trained about how to handle these situations. Um, so, you know, let's proceed in, in, along those lines. The, the manager would bring the person to HR, then it's HR's responsibility to investigate the man matter in more detail. Another thing that the line manager would need to be trained on is what how to handle it when the employee comes to you and says, I want to share something with you confidentially. I don't want you to tell anybody else, but, you know, Teresa keeps on rubbing my back and I just don't feel comfortable with it. And but I don't want to make a big deal of it. Teresa's nice. I just can't put up with this anymore. Uh, the bottom line is when an employee comes to you and makes a complaint, it's not anonymous. There's no uh, confidence. I mean, you want to share it only on an each no basis, but that uh, the barn door has already been opened. There's no going back and saying, oh, okay, well, I won't tell anybody. No, you have an obligation. You have an obligation to everyone else who might be being sexually harassed by this person. And you have an obligation to your employer because your employer is expecting you to bring that to the attention of whomever the right person within the organization is so that legal risk can be managed. So there is not an option of keeping the issue confidential. Now, I mean, there could be. I'm gonna, there, there could be situations where it's really so, so far from sexual harassment that honestly, to call it even a sexual harassment complaint is silly. For example, um, uh, uh, Mary comes to you and says, Bob asked me on a date. It's just awkward now. Uh, well, has Bob done anything else? No. When you said no, has Bob asked you out again? No. Is he staring at you? Is he being rude to you? No. Has he said sexual things? Has he touched you? No. I just feel awkward dating or working with somebody who asked me on a date that I didn't want to go on. That doesn't sound like sexual harassment. That type of thing, I would still, if I'm the manager, take it to HR just so that they're aware because uh, Bob may have done other things in the work environment that you're unaware of um, that might cause HR department to look at this situation a little bit differently. But it certainly doesn't sound like it's sexual harassment. And so there may well not need to be an investigation under those circumstances. Okay, so when complaints arise, and let's assume now that you're the person investigating. And again, sometimes the legal department investigates these things. Sometimes the HR department investigates these things. And sometimes there's a combination. So the first thing is to be prompt and to be respectful. Drop everything to meet with this employee. Thank them for their time. Listen sympathetically, but without judgment, without indicating, oh, that's terrible that happened to you, or things like that. You don't know what really happened at this point. You are just listening, um, asking smart follow-up questions, things like, uh, well, did anybody else see that? Or do you still have those emails? Or... Um, what day was that? Uh, is there anyone you told immediately after that happened about this? Those types of, of questions. And you obviously want to share it only on a need to know basis. Um, whomever's investigating it will need to make some findings. We'll need to say after everyone's been interviewed, this is what we think happened. As we talked before, the EOC has some suggestions about how to consider and develop a credibility determination. But at the end of the day, you just have to uh, apply your best reasoning skills to decide who you believe and who you don't believe. Usually there will be some differences. There'll be some similarities between what the individuals say, but some differences. And so it's really a credibility determination at the end. Let's assume, or obviously when you're doing the investigation, you have to let the, the uh, 
uh, alleged victim know that you're going to have to talk to the alleged harasser. The alleged harasser is due is entitled to some due process here. A, a complaint has been made about him or her that have potentially significant career implications and so that person needs to have an opportunity to present his or her side of that situation. But you ought to, ought to let the alleged victim know that retaliation will not be permitted and that if there is any concerns about retaliation, if anything happens, that the uh, alleged victim ought to let the employer know immediately. There needs to be appropriate consequences um, and they can vary. A certainly termination when uh, there, there is a finding that there has been sexual harassment can be really uh, appropriate um, and that's probably going to be where you end up most of the time. Certainly if it's a second offense then that's almost certainly where you're going to end up. Um, but for lesser offenses uh, sometimes uh, there can be other consequences. Whether or not um, you turn, well, I guess if you terminate the person, if you don't decide not to turn the person, even if you decide this, her, this person did not really harass the other person, it's still a good idea to send the harasser back to sexual harassment training um, and to document that so that uh, it's very clear that this person knows what the expectations are. Sometimes employers will send the alleged victim back to sexual harassment training to refresh that person on the process. You will, if you do that, you want to make it clear that this is not um, a retaliatory or a disciplinary type uh, action on the part. Just a refresher because this employee has had need to use the service so we want to make sure they're fully aware of how the, that process works. But definitely retrain. Obviously, you're going to want to retrain them separately. Um, so it will be separate training sessions, obviously. Sometimes <clears throat> a complaints will be anonymous. This could be an, a letter or uh, email sent from an unidentified email box, even a note put under your door, or it could be through some 1-800 number. Those complaints have to be taken seriously. Now, sometimes they're so vague you can't do anything with them. I can remember a few times at JCPenney where we'd get a call and we didn't even know what store this person worked at. And they didn't give us names and so it really was impossible to investigate it. Um, but uh, if, it's, if, it's, if you know enough to know what department it is, even if you don't know which person allegedly is harassing, you can just do um, interviews of across, what oftentimes called cross-sectional interviews of the people in the department. Hey, tell me what's going on. Any concerns you have? What's the work environment like? Um, and you don't even, maybe in, if it really is a very vague complaint, you don't even necessarily have to raise the issue of sexual harassment. But of course, if sexual misconduct is specifically alleged, you want to ask things like, are you aware of uh, sexual jokes being shared or are you aware of touching happening in the work environment? Those types of questions. So a cross-sectional interview can be an effective way of handling those situations. Keep in mind also that the complainer is not always the victim. It could be that um, Teresa is seeing a Susan uh, harass Rick. Teresa is the one who complains. Rick doesn't complain. Um, so it can, and that complaint needs to be taken seriously as well. Whoever has made the complaint needs to know that the matter has been closed. If it's the victim, the victim ought to be, uh, you know, given some feedback about the situation. Uh, we, we're concerned about your continued employment. We want you to feel comfortable here. If you have additional concerns, please bring them to our attention. We have a no retaliation policy. If you feel like you're being retaliated against, please alert me. And then probably most important, not maybe not most important, but very importantly, touch base with that victim from time to time. Put it on your day planner. Uh, I'd probably touch base with them within a week or two after the close of the investigation. And then probably on a month basis for a couple of months, then maybe at the six month point, and then maybe at the uh, annual appraisal, if, if you're in HR and you are present for that, hey, everything going okay. Um, as you move farther away from that date, you can maybe be less specific about, I'm touching base with you about your sexual harassment situation. You want to document each one of those conversations and you want to make sure they happen in an appropriate place. So you don't want to, as you're passing someone in the hall, say, oh, by the way, is everything okay at work? 
um, they're not going to feel comfortable sharing something to you at that point. Um, so you'd want to, um, if they have an office with the door, maybe visit them in their office and chat with them. If they don't, then, and you have an office with the door, you'd want to invite them to your office. Hey, I just want to take a couple minutes of your time to make sure everything's going okay. There hasn't been a recurrence of your concerns before, whatever. If you don't have an office with the door, then you'll want to meet in a conference room with a door that you can close, giving them the opportunity to share the concerns that they may have. So you want to complete the loop and document that you ask those questions and document the answer that you get. Hopefully the answer will be, oh no, everything's great now, but if it's not, then you may need to conduct another investigation. So let's talk about the remedy. We talked about it being appropriate, but it doesn't need to be disproportionate. Uh, some employers you know, say, well, we're just going to fire everyone who engages in sexual harassment. If an employer is consistent in that area, that's probably okay, but you may be losing some good workers who just exercise some poor judgment. And so it's, it, it, it may make sense not to fire every person who you find has harassed. You want to have a remedy that is calculated to stop the harassment and that doesn't punish the victim but it doesn't necessarily have to be termination. Um, moving the harasser to a different department, um, putting the harasser on some type of suspension, those approaches can work as well. You definitely don't want to punish the victim of the harassment. So let's say the decision is, well, these two people can't work together. Well, you don't want to move the victim. You want to move the harasser. Now, of course, if the victim wants to move, it's fine, but you don't want to put the victim in a disadvantageous position because that could, could be considered retaliation. So let's say you, you're deciding to move one of the workers to a different shift. What you might want to do is give the victim the option. Listen, we can move the alleged harasser to the other shift or you can't. What's your preference? Or maybe to a different department or whatever. So don't be careful not to appear to engage in harassment. One thing that happens, especially when the allegations are serious, is that you may want to just send them both home for a period of time so you can gather your facts. Maybe you're worried this is going to be the talk of the department. It's going to be a major distraction. Uh, both people may be talking with other people to kind of get people on their sides. And so you may decide, well, it may make sense to send them both home. Sending the harasser home is a pretty safe course of action. You can decide later on whether the time off is going to be paid or unpaid. Obviously, if you terminate them, it's probably going to be unpaid. Um, if you decide that they are guilty, you're probably also going to keep it unpaid. But if you decide that really there wasn't a lot to the allegation, then you might consider making it paid. You can do a similar thing with the victim, but I would follow the victim's lead. If the victim wants to stay in the work environment, in most cases, I would allow that victim to continue the work environment. If you decide that the better course is to excuse the work, the victim from the work environment and the victim seems okay with that, then you definitely want to make their time off paid. They shouldn't have to use any vacation time or other benefits. Let's consider this scenario. So Mary saw her supervisor, Bob, misbehaving with Anna, one of her coworkers. So Bob is the boss, Mary and, Adam report. Mary and Anna report to Bob. Later she asks Anna about the incident and discovers that this is a pattern. But Anna doesn't want to complain about it. She's worried about job security, so Mary complains about it. A few weeks later, Bob fires Anna on the basis of insubordination. Mary can file a claim with the EOC on behalf of Anna for sexual harassment and retaliation. That is true. Also, um, if Mary is retaliated against, she can file a claim on her own behalf for retaliation, even though Mary herself was never subject to sexual harassment. Mary's employed as a nutritionist at Elephant Spa. At work, she was constantly subjected to her manager's sexual comments and gestures. Unable to bear the harassment, she decides to quit instead of going through the um, complaint process. If Mary um, uses a, uh, a sec uh, files a complaint of sexual harassment against Elephant Spa, I would say that the employer cannot use the Farragher Ellerth defense because even though the employer didn't uh, actually sexual uh, didn't terminate her or something along those lines, so there isn't an adverse job action. 
uh, it was their supervisor doing that. And so the, the Farragher-Ellerth defense is not truly applicable in this situation. It's a, a bit of a, a, a difficult uh, situation because the employer, excuse me, the manager is the actual one creating the hostile work environment. So the better answer here is the employer cannot use a Farragher-Ellerth affirmative defense to avoid liability. Okay, uh, so Civil, right, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1991. Um, this statute amended several different statutes, but one of the statutes it amended is uh, Title VII. And um, it used to be the case before 1991 that employees who alleged discrimination or harassment weren't able to um, uh, collect anything but back pay and front pay. Well, you can see in a sexual harassment case, if you weren't fired, you weren't really going to be able to get any financial uh, compensation. And so therefore, there really was no advantage to the person suing. But in 1991, the law was changed and for harassment and discrimination claims, an employee can get up to $300,000 in compensatory or punitive damages. This cap is for both of these combined. So you can't get 300 for compensatory and 300 for punitive. Um, and this is just for the largest employers. If you're a smaller employer, the cap can be lower. And so um, let's say an employee who hasn't actually lost any income as a result of the harassment, he or she potentially is eligible for issues, issues employed by a large company for the $300,000. And there are jury trials that used to, before 1991, these were all uh, what are called bench trials where the judge decided the evidence. Um, with jury trials, uh, the, the feeling is that juries are probably more gonna, gonna be more sympathetic to uh, potential plaintiffs. Usually juries are more sympathetic than judges and so the thought process here is that this is another advantage to the employee, to the uh, person filing the lawsuit. They're more likely to get a favorable finding with a jury than a judge, or at least that's the thought process. Okay, so we have now completed our discussion about employer liability. Let's now talk about tort and criminal liability. So tort actions, these are state law claims that are, uh, these are uh, going to be available in many cases to victims of sexual harassment. So for example, let's say my boss gives me a back massage that I don't want. He's not hurting me physically. I don't have bruises or marks on my body, but so it's not that I'm in physical pain because of what he did, but I'm really creeped out. He's invaded my personal space. Well, that would be this a tort of battery, which is unwanted touching. Assault is when somebody is afraid of unwanted touching. So this could be some uh, um, a coworker who keeps on saying, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm going to pinch you in the bottom on the bottom, or um, I'm going to grab you, or something like that." That is, even if he never grabs the person, he has put that person in apprehension or fear of unwanted touching. So that is assault. And again, there's no need for there actually to be touching. So typically when you have a battery situation, you're also going to have a, an assault. But you can have an assault without a battery. Obviously, the most serious types of situations are going to be where there's actually been a sexual assault or a rape. And then we're going to look to the penal code for that state, which we'll look at in a few moments for Texas. Then you can also have intentional infliction of emotional distress. This is a tort. You can see that the person committing the tort has to intend the harm. Now, this is a fairly difficult tort to prove, but if uh, the plaintiff is able to prove it with respect to uh, the supervisor under that agency responding at superior idea, then the employer can also be liable under an intentional infliction of emotional distress complaint. False imprisonment is another path. Let's say uh, a coworker or a supervisor uh, imprisons in the sense of uh, limits a person's movement. Let's say you're, you're back in the stock room and somebody comes in and they block your ability to leave. They're coming at you, hey, I'm gonna kiss you or whatever, and you, they're blocking the only way out of the stock room. Well, that could be, uh, potentially a false imprisonment situation. Intentional interference with contractual relations can arise, especially if um, you are being uh, uh, uh,
blackballed from getting other places of employment. Maybe you left that, the original place because of the sexual harassment and now your supervisor is trying to stop you from being able to get other positions or is trying to get you fired from other positions. You could have an intentional interference with contractual relationships issue. But probably the big ones that we see most commonly are going to be assault and battery and possibly these issues in truly egregious circumstances. When we're looking at tort liability, there are no limitations to compensatory and punitive damages. So we don't even have this issue of the $300,000 that we have under Title VII. Let's consider this scenario. Mary is a veterinary nurse at the Frisco Animal Clinic. It has 20 full-time employees. So therefore, Title VII applies to this employer. During one of her night shifts, Bob, a coworker, follows her to the parking lot, stands very close to her, and touches her inappropriately. So Bob can bring, uh, excuse me, Mary can bring civil actions against Bob in state court for assault and battery. And again, possibly under a respondeat superior claim, it could be something that the employer can be responsible for. Let's say Bob is the owner of the business or Bob is uh, her immediate supervisor. We could have a uh, respondeat superior situation. So what are some ideas that we want to consider from um, how to avoid some of these issues? Well, obviously we need an anti-sexual harassment policy. We need it to be communicated clearly to, manage, to both uh, supervisors and subordinates. We need to have a robust reporting structure that is also communicated. Uh, we need to have leading by example. Uh, supervisors and managers need to uh, really be like Caesar's wife, above reproach. They can't engage in playful little humor. They shouldn't have salty language. Um, uh, I mean, they can have fun in the work environment, but they shouldn't have a sexual component to it at all. Um, there needs to be an open channel for talking to supervisors. Supervisors ought to be instructed to be approachable, to understand when somebody needs to speak to them confidentially to make themselves available for that. Um, all complaints of sexual harassment need to be taken seriously and be, need to be thoroughly and quickly investigated. And um, when uh, sexual harassment is found to be the case, the culture needs to make it clear that that's not acceptable and that consequences need to be appropriate. And information about the allegations need to be handled strictly just on a need to know basis. Follow up regularly with that victim to make sure that there is no continuing problems and document those follow ups. Um, before we uh, conclude this, I want to take just a second and show you some of the law that we have in Texas. Um, I pulled up the Texas statutes. This is, um, uh, here, let me do this one first. This is um, the uh, a sexual offenses statute here. I, don't know, I have these lit up like this. Uh, here we go. Oh, that's what I have. Get rid of that. Okay. Um, you can see that we have lots of different sexual offenses. Um, obviously, hopefully, we're not talking about young children uh, in the, wor the work environment. So we'll move on from this one. Uh, public lewdness. That can be an offense. Um, uh, a person commits an offense if a person knowingly engages in the following acts in a public place, certainly most workplaces would be a public place, or if not in a perfect place, the person is reckless about whether another is present who will be offended by or alarmed by the person's act of sexual intercourse, act of deviant sexual intercourse, or act of sexual contact. So public lewdness can be a basis. Indecent exposure, another basis where we can have criminal liability. Again, we're talking about crimes here. We're not talking about torts. Um, these are things that would be prosecuted by the district attorney, wouldn't be something uh, that would be a civil action. We also have indecent exposure. A person commits an offense if he exposes his genitals with intent to arouse or gratify the sexual desires of any person, and he is reckless about he, whether another is present who will be offended or alarmed by his act. If you um, are involved in a school situation, this could be an important issue. 
invasive visual recording. This unfortunately sometimes is an issue in the workplace where people are secretly uh, putting cameras in bathrooms or changing rooms or other places where people have the expectation that they will be in a private situation. So a person commits this offense if without another person's consent, the person photographs or videotapes um, an intimate area of a person if the other person had a reasonable expectation that the intimate area is not in public view. Voyeurism is obviously very similar. A person commits an offense to the person with the intent to arouse or gratify the sexual desire of the actor, meaning the person doing the action, observes another person by the person's consent while that person is in a dwelling or a structure in which the other person has a reasonable expectation for privacy. So again, a bathroom, a dressing room in a work situation. Let's look at sexual coercion. A person commits an offense if the person intentionally threatens, including by coercion or extortion, to commit an offense under uh, this particular statute, to obtain or return for not, threat, not, uh, not committing the uh, threatened offense or in connection with the threatened offense in the following actions. Intimate visual material, an act involving sexual conduct causing arousal, gratification, monetary benefit or other benefit of value. So this would be um, if there's like say videotapes of a person that there's basically kind of a blackmail type situation. So these are what we call sexual offenses. But you'll notice that rape isn't in this category because rape is considered an assault. It's a sexual assault, but it's actually under the assaultive offenses category. So let's see here we have sexual assault and we also have aggravated sexual assault. Okay, so these are the two. So let's consider what are what is required from a criminal justice perspective to prove sexual assault. A person commits an offense if the person intentionally or knowingly causes um, a sexual or penetrates a sexual organ of another person without that person's consent or uh, anyway, we'll, and then aggravated sexual assault would be If there is, um, uh, if the person, in addition, the, the same things we were talking about before of the penetration, um, if the person causes seriously serious bodily injury or attempts to cause the death of the person, or by acts or words places the victim in fear that any, that any person will become the victim of of, the, of violence or serious bodily injury or kidnapping. So again, so this for aggravated assault, we need to have either actual serious injuries or the threat of serious injuries as part of the um, sexual assault. So um, at this point, I think we've completed our presentation on sexual harassment. I hope that it is useful, has been useful for you. It, as always, if you have questions about the material, please don't hesitate to send me an email. My email is cgroover at colin.edu or better yet, come by and see me so we can talk about it in more details. I thank you for your attention and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.